two, a one, two, three, four. <laughs>
Still 
got your Bibles, open them up to Mark. We are in Mark chapter 1, and uh, just starting off in this gospel, not too far into it, but we're going to be picking up here. Mark chapter 1, verse 9, if you join me there. And it begins here, it came to pass that in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth to Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan, and immediately... Coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. And then a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And this is Mark saying everything a little faster. He says he was from Nazareth, went to Galilee. Then he's speaking down south into Jordan being baptized. He's cramming it all together. But he wants us to know something. The Heavenly Father said, this is my son. This is my son. Listen, we're all in here today, and I think it's really for only one reason. It's because Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the Son of God. He came for us. He came to give us a message from heaven. And if he's truly the Son of God, and he is, then it is important for you to know that. Because uh, if God... If the invisible God would send forth his son, then he's worthy to be heard. He's worthy to be listened to. He's worthy to be paid attention. And this is Mark's emphasis that he is the son. Remember this in in Mark 1? The very first line is the, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the son of God. So he's trying to tell us this is the son of God. And he comes to the Jordan and... Uh, he's baptized there by John the Baptist, and John sees the Spirit come and, 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 and fill him there to, to reside on him and stay. Now, God wanted to make himself known. The invisible God became visible through his Son. The Bible says the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. In other words, who, who God was became an actual person. And to become a person that you and I could see he had to be born of Mary. Born of Mary. And and I've heard some people say this. I I don't agree with it at all. But where, uh, well, when when Jesus came in to be there in Mary, he couldn't be any part of Mary, couldn't be any part of her egg or anything, or she'd be polluted. So God would just, just basically put something into her. She would just be the container. And, and then it would be birth. Well, then that would be birth by Mary, but not of Mary. This baby was going to become of Mary. You, what, what did the father say in the garden? What, what did God say there in the garden? It says it's the seed of the woman that's going to crush the head. The seed of the woman. And, and let me ask something else. If Jesus didn't have us, a piece of us, then what is his sacrifice on the cross paying for? If he's not one of us, how can he pay for us? Listen, if, if, if he didn't have to be born of a woman, then Jesus, or, or God could have just zapped a Jesus there with, with Adam, and Adam could have killed the Jesus, and everything would have been good. But the problem was, that was not of us. 
So he couldn't zap us somebody. He had to become one of us. Are you hearing me, church? Now, the Bible says the Holy Spirit hovered over Mary. So that which is, was conceived of her was by the Holy Spirit, which is the Spirit of God, the invisible Spirit of God. Therefore, that which is born of her will also be called the Son of God, not just the Son of David. So it's of two connections. It's of us, Son of David, but it's of God, the Son of God. And Jesus was perfect. He didn't mess up. How many of you know the, the blood, the bloodline comes from the male seed? So in essence, without God, Jesus couldn't have his blood. And so therefore, he becomes one of us. He lives a perfect life. And he's doing the regular stuff. He, he is, he, he's just like us in that. He was a baby. He cried. How many of you know he had to have his diapers changed? Can you imagine? Son of God had to have his diapers changed. Wasn't it Jesus who said, yeah, you eat food and it goes out to crawl? Isn't that what he said? <laughs> Meaning it goes through the whole digest. And then hey, how about that? He had to use the bathroom. <laughs> See, we don't think about this because we go like, well, how can we think about those things? Because he wouldn't be the son of God. No, he was the perfect son of God going through human issues. When he said he knows what you go through, it is literal. He even knows what it's like to go through death. Yeah, don't shout me down when I'm preaching. Good. <laughs> the Bible says he had to grow in wisdom and stature and in favor of man and God. He had to grow. He had to learn. Just like you have to grow, you had to learn. He discovered who he was, what he was, and lived a life that was worthy to be put on that cross. So at 30 years old, he comes to the baptism. He comes there to John. He submits to it, and he is baptized. That's when the Spirit fills him up. And, and, and I'm telling you, the Bible says he was filled and it stayed there. And the Bible says literally he had the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Bodily. In him. The fullness. What does that mean? Now God had a vehicle to do what he wanted to without the, the, the person resisting. Jesus didn't resist his Father. He even said... I go wherever the Father tells me. I say whatever the Father tells me to say. Can you imagine what God can do with somebody who's not resisting him? That's Jesus. That is Jesus. Now watch this. Watch this next uh, Mark chapter 3. Because we're going to stay on this theme of Son of God that Mark's trying to tell us. Mark chapter 3, verse 11. And the unclean spirits... Whenever they saw him, do you, do you hear that? Whenever they saw him. Unclean spirits, whenever they saw Jesus, who? The Jesus had just got this baptism. <laughs> whenever they saw him, fell down before him and cried out, saying, You are the Son of God. But he sternly warned them that they should not... Make him known. And we have no recording that at 30 years or younger that any evil spirit ever did that. But when he's baptized and he is filled with the fullness of who God is, and, and what happens then? He's led into the wilderness for what? For temptation to happen? You know, I, I told you, I don't believe the devil even knew where he was. But he does now. And the Spirit leads him into the wilderness for what purpose? For the devil now to come and test the one that he just heard from heaven that he's the Son of God. And what does he tempt him about? If you're the Son of God. If you're the Son of God. If you're the Son of God. Does this seem familiar? If you're born again. If you've been saved. If you're filled with the Holy Spirit. Same thing he does to you. He wants you to question who God says you are. He wants you to question who God says you can become. He did the same thing to Jesus. Now I want to ask you this. If Jesus in the flesh, having lived a perfect life, needed the infilling of the Holy Spirit, then what about you? What about you? See, he was conceived of the Holy Spirit. He was born of the Spirit. 
He had the Spirit of God. He lived a perfect life. He was being taught, led, and all that. But when he was going to go into ministry, before he started his ministry, what did he do? He got the fullness of everything he could get from God. What did he say to his own disciples? He said, stay to Jerusalem until you are endued with power. They were already believers. He already said, rejoice that your name's written in heaven. But to go out and do the work, to go out and do the work, to go out and to fulfill what God really would have you be, to start being conformed and to, to grow and to be like him, uh, you need to stop resisting the Holy Spirit and have the Holy Spirit come and fill as much of the house as he can have. You know, we're not perfect like Jesus. You know, I've heard this before. I think it's adequate. We leak. We leak. They got filled with the Holy Spirit, and then later on it says they asked for boldness. They were filled with the Holy Spirit again. And Paul says, don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. We need to be walking with and be filled with the Holy Spirit to be able to do the work and the ministry and to be able to be conformed, to continue to grow, to continue to learn, to let him lead, to teach, to guide, to direct. Jesus had that fullness, and when he now is walking around, what happens? Demons cry out. It didn't say if. It says whenever. Whenever he came close to where demons were, they now cried out. What's the difference? They see this fullness of the, the invisible God emanating from him. When he walks into the room, the fullness of God just walked into the room. Come on, church, are you with me? And now whenever he went anywhere, demons would cry out, you are the Son of God. You are the Son of God. Look at the next one. This is Mark chapter 5, verse 6. When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him, and he cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. This is one that's filled with demons, and, and he comes to worship? Well, so what does it mean to worship? He identifies who Jesus is. That's right. If you came here to worship, you need to identify who he, who he is. And if you truly identify him as the Son of God, you'll live differently than maybe you were before you came in here. See, well, we've come together to worship. Well, how do you worship? You identify God for who he is. And when you identify for who he is, you begin to act differently to him. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things that I tell you to, he asks. Why do you acknowledge me and say you're worshiping when you do not acknowledge who I truly am? If I'm Lord, then live like I'm Lord. If I'm Son of God, then live like I'm Son of God. All right? So the Son of God submitted totally to his Father. Now demons are crying out. And they cry out, don't torment us. One said, if you come to torment us before the time... Uh, if somebody walked in and you screamed out, Ah! What have we to do with you, Son of God? Is that a joyful cry? No, that's a tormented cry. Isn't it amazing that when God comes in His fullness, that in the spirit realm, darkness screams out? When the Spirit comes for us, it brings peace, not distress. Uh, Jesus, in revealing who he is, is torment to the darkness, torment to those who oppose God. He's joy and peace to those who are with God. You know, I've had people say, you know, how could a loving God create hell and cast people into it? And, well, what if God doesn't have to create hell at all? What if heaven and hell are based on relationship with God? If I know God, then the fire of God is peace and joy to me. If I don't know God, then the fire of God is hell. Remember, David said, where am I going to go that God isn't? Well, let me ask you this. Where are you going to die that God isn't? And as soon as you die, don't you think you're in his realm now? And when you're in his realm, I think there's two things you're, you're going to know. You're either going to know you're with him or you're going to know you're not. One's going to be joy and peace. One's going to be torment. And joy and peace goes on for how long? And how much does torment go on? 
forever because God can't remove himself. So God's not a mean God or a bad God. God is simply God. And knowing that for right now you are shielded from that, the day you die, you're going to be in it. And he warns you ahead of time that it's either going to be peace and joy or torment and hell. And I believe it both happen because it's a picture of God's presence. For those of us that are his, eternal bliss, eternal joy of the relationship. For those of us who are not, uh, why is it when, when he told parables, he talked about those who were not, he says there'll be gnashing of teeth. and, and all. Why did he describe it as simply not having that relationship? It becomes hell because it is. To not have relationship with God is hell. You may not know it yet. But have you ever tried to do all the things of the devil and then have peace? I'm telling you, it doesn't work. You just go deeper and deeper and darker and darker. And if you want peace, that's not the way to go. Um, all right. Mark chapter 9, verse 7 says this. And a cloud came and overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son. Hear him. Suddenly, when they had looked around, they saw no one anymore but Jesus, or but only Jesus with themselves. This is when the transfiguration happened, and they saw all these ones. But what's the, the real message is once again, when the glory cloud came and they had to hit the ground, they heard a voice from heaven, the heavenly Father saying, This is my beloved Son. And if he's the Son, then what must you do? Hear him. Hear him. The Old Testament, uh, if you heard, you obeyed. That's why Jesus says, give them for those that have ears to hear, meaning they will obey. This message is for those that will obey. Because if you don't, you won't have the promises. If you don't, you won't have the eternity. And so Mark is trying to say, this is the Son of God. He is worthy of being paid attention to. He is worthy of being paid attention to. Mark uh, chapter 12, verse 1. Then he began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it, uh, dug a place uh, for the wine vat and built a tower, and he leased it to vine dressers and went into a far country. Now, at, at vintage time, he sent a servant to the vine dressers that he might receive some of the fruit of the vineyard from the vine dresser. So it's all his. He was just asking for a piece of the fruit to come back to him. What is it that the, the, the Bible says about the world? Everything in the world, the fullness of it, is his. We don't own anything. We, do, we don't own it. We're just, he allows us to use it for a while. I'm sorry to tell you this, but however much wealth you get, you're not going to be able to keep it. Sorry. It's not yours. And if somebody inherits yours, sorry, you're not going to be able to keep it either. Some of us, we live our whole life just waiting for an inheritance here on earth. L listen, you ought to live your whole life because of the inheritance you're going to get in heaven. That's where you ought to be living. That, one, that one's going to be permanent. But around here, the wealth... The stuff that you, you work so hard for and you pay attention to. The, the parable of the man who's got a good harvest. He said, I'm going to build big barns and I'm going to put it all in there. And then I'm going to take my ease. And God said, you fool, your life's going to come taken tonight. You put all your time and your trust in that and you didn't pay attention to me. He called him a fool. Well, we're not going to take it with us. It's all his. He was just asking Give me, just give me some of the fruit. I'd like some of the fruit. It's just like God giving you what you have right now, what you're able to walk with right now. And then he says, just give me a tithe. Just give it back to the, the functioning of the ministry, of the church, of the temple, of whatever. He just asked for a piece of what it was. And my dear, you get to figure out what to do with the 90%. Now, he'd like you to listen to him on that too. But you know what? You don't get to keep yours. It, it all goes back. And they took him and beat him, the messenger that came, sent him away empty-handed. 
And again he sent to them another servant. And at him they threw stones and wounded him in the head and sent him away shamefully treated. This is where in the other services I said, where is this vineyard, Portland? <laughs> well, they beat up the messengers. You got people trying to help other people, they beat them up for it. Listen, when, when, when you're not... When you don't have godly things happen to you, ungodly things happen all around you. And these people were thinking about themselves and ungodly things are happening to the messengers. And so uh, I said it that way because in the last service, they didn't, they didn't get it. So I said, I better set it up a little differently or they won't even get it. What's going on? And again, he sent another and him they killed. And many others beating in some case. It's talking about the prophets and how they're doing what they want to do with the prophets. They're beating them up. They're killing them. They're stoning them. They're doing whatever they want to do. Therefore, still having how many sons? Having one son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Having one son, his beloved. His only begotten, having only one son, he also sent him to them last, last, meaning this is the end of it. It all culminates here. Saying they will respect my son, meaning they should respect my son. That's why we're talking today about the son of God, because you should respect the son. But those vine dressers said among themselves, this is the heir Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. See, they, they lied to themselves. They fooled themselves to thinking that if we could kill the son, somehow we'll get the inheritance. If we can kill the Messiah, somehow we'll keep our place, and they were going to lose their place. They're going to go before God, and there's going to be a penalty for rejecting the son. But they thought, man, if I can do this, we'll get the inheritance. And like we said, doesn't matter what you have, you're going to lose it all. And let me just say this. There, there is an inheritance. God had a plan for everybody to get something. He really did. You know, the Bible says he desires that how many would be saved? All would be saved. All would come to repentance. He, he had a plan for that. But, but, but listen, let, let me tell you how you get the inheritance. Because when Jesus died lived a perfect life, and paid our penalty, was willing to be our Savior. God raised him from the dead, and he received a name that's above every other name, which is, at the name of Jesus, every knee would bow, and confess that he is what? Lord. So he got the name Lord. He is now the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And in raising from the dead, the Bible says he received an inheritance. What is the inheritance? It's everything that there is. Everything was made by him and for him it was all everything is Jesus that's why he's the beginning and he's the end you want to know what life is all about it's all about Jesus the son of God and he received the entire inheritance everything people fight over here and they war for and they fight for and they invest in and they try to save it hoard it and they can't keep it because God has already knows his son has inherited it it's all his. It's all his. So if Jesus has all the inheritance, then how do we get any? Through the Son. There is an inheritance now in the saints because those that are his will receive from him of his own inheritance. We get an inheritance now only through relationship with Jesus Christ. You can do whatever you want. You can struggle every other way. You can do all the good deeds, all the whatever, and try to. You can't do it without Jesus. You will only get inheritance with Jesus. They thought they could get it by getting him out of the way, and they lost everything. So those who took him and killed him and cast him uh, out of the vineyard, therefore they, uh, what will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the vine dressers and give the vine the vineyard to others. Have you not even read this scripture? The stone 
which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. And that chief cornerstone is, is, is a reference to the one holy temple of God, that he is the chief cornerstone. We are all built off of him, and we become that temple or the place, the living of the very spirit of God, the very one that we say we love will be living in and through us, through Jesus and his relationship to all of us. That is the future, that is the promise, that is the inheritance, and the only way we're going to be a part of it is that we had to honor the Son. We had to honor who He was. So you hear His message, you believe the Word of God, and you receive Him into your life. You have this relationship that is not shallow, it is deep. Uh, he, doesn't talk, he doesn't talk about starting to believe, He says believe until the end. Live this life until the end. Those that endure until the end, the Bible says what? Shall be saved. Um, Mark chapter 13, verse 32 says this, But of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. So Jesus has has done the work, Jesus has paid the price, He's been risen from the dead, He is established as Lord, He sits at the right hand of the Father, and one day the Father's going to say, go get your bride. That's going to happen. And because it's going to happen, verse 33, take heed, watch, and pray, because He is coming back. So take heed, pay attention, watch, be alert, and pray, for you do not know when the time is. It is like a man going to a far country who, who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to each his work. You see, don't tell me you're a servant of God if you don't have to do anything for God. I'm saved and going to heaven. And I've been paying attention to everything in the world. I've been doing all this stuff. And it's okay, Pastor. Grace will take care of it. Don't tell me you're a servant of God if he hasn't given you an assignment. How many of you know we all have the ministry of reconciliation? You know, oh, well, pastor, that's, that's good for you. You talk to people. You live it, you know. Uh, no, no, we've all been given that ministry. But we all have assignments. We all have stuff to do. He gives us something to do. And commanded the doorkeeper to watch, meaning... While everybody's taking care of what they're supposed to be taking care of, when I come, I want you to be ready to open that door. And everybody should know, oh, the doorkeeper is ready to open at any moment for the Savior. And it's very important then, if I take that seriously, that I'm doing the work I've been assigned. Boy, it's getting quiet in this place. Because of that, because he may come, any, and you see the doorkeeper at the door who will open up and let the master come in, because of that, watch therefore, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming. In the evening, at midnight, at the crowing of the rooster, so that's like 3 o'clock in the morning, I know. <laughs> Man, we, we had somebody that had, I don't know how many chickens in their yard, that just down the road, just about a half mile. But I'm telling you, at 3 o'clock in the morning when the air is thin, and, and back, I'm talking back when we didn't have air conditioning. Um, when, my, when I grew up at my dad's house, we'd have the windows up. And around 3 o'clock, those roosters would start. They'd fill the air, man. You just got used to hearing these roosters. I felt sorry for those that weren't a half mile away. But they'll start crowing at 3 o'clock in the morning. Or in the morning, 6 o'clock on, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. Isn't it amazing that he talked about the whole night time when you think you should be allowed to sleep? But he was saying, he's using it as a parable, he was saying there is no time to sleep in the kingdom. Now, yes, physically you'll have to sleep, but there is no time to sleep in the kingdom. Every moment that you're aware, you're a kingdom servant. Wow. There is no sleeping time in the kingdom. You know, hey, I turned 65 in the natural here. I'm, I'm retired now. You young people, you do stuff for God. I'm going to tour the world, man. Oh, yeah. I remember when a sister said, you know, 
I, I said, uh, you know, I was, I was getting older now. Now I thought it's, it's the kids' turn to do that. And, uh, and they said, but then they started coming here and started hearing this and said, wow, I realize I'm still supposed to be doing something. And it's the truth. We don't get to retire from the kingdom. We keep right on going. So knowing that he could come at any time and he does not want to find you sleeping, look what it says in verse 37. And what I say to you, I say to a few people. No, what I say to you, I say to all. I say to all. Watch. Watch. Are you watching today? Look at your life this past week. You know, we talk about seven days. We mean don't waste your seven days. Don't fall asleep on your seven days. Don't go to work and come back to work and go to sleep and you found out a whole 24 hours was wasted because <laughs> I never paid attention to God. We, th that's why we say you have seven days. We want you to pay attention to them. Understand the doorkeeper's at the door. God could come back. Christ could come back. What are you doing with yourself? Are you growing in him? Are you paying attention? Is he able to use you? Do you hear his voice? Well, Jesus himself says, so watch, pay attention, be alert. Don't be asleep on the job. Okay. And then Mark chapter 15, verse 39. Once again, Mark is telling us of the Son of God. So when the centurion who stood opposite him saw that he cried out like this and breathed his last, he said, truly this man was the Son of God. He watched Jesus go through his three hours to the point of death. And when it was all over, he said, this is the Son of God. I'm telling you, brother, if people watch you die, they ought to see something different. They ought to be able to say, this is a child of God. This is somebody connected with God. They ought to see something that is different than that. And listen, another verse says, they all said this is the Son of God. Not just one, they all said it. They all were impressed with what they saw. How many crucifixions do you think they did? They did a bunch of them. They knew how to nail a nail. They knew how to be tough on somebody. And yet when it was over, they said, this was the Son of God. How about when your life is over, they go, this is a child of God. Even people who don't know God will believe God because they watched you die. What do you think it means when, when Saul, who was also called Paul, watched Stephen be stoned and said he had the face of an angel? He's talking to those people in the Sanhedrin. and Who, who told Luke to write that? I believe it was Paul who said, I looked at him and he had the face of an angel. You think that didn't convict him? And then when he died, he said, don't put this sin to their charge. And Paul was changed. Paul was changed. Let it be so with us, like it was with our master. Let them know who you are. 1 John chapter 3, verse 7. Little children, let no one deceive you. How about that? You mean the little children can be deceived? Now you got to understand, this is John who is older now. He's one of the older ones. He's talking to believers and he says little children don't be deceived don't be deceived so let him say it to us don't be deceived let no one deceive you he who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous who's the he Jesus Jesus is righteous no sin he's now Lord of all and those that are his Practice being like Him. Church, do you hear me? We practice looking like Jesus. People ought to be around you and something ought to be happening. It ought to be happening. Just as He is righteous, for He who sins is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. Now, it doesn't mean that you failed or you did something. It's saying a lifestyle. A lifestyle of doing wrong and opposing God is of the devil. 
See, look, we're not perfect. We're being perfected. I'm never going to be perfect like Christ until the day I die and I get to see him. The Bible says when we see him, we shall be like him. That's where our perfection is complete. But here we are being perfected. Why are we being perfected? Because we are on the journey with him. I end up practicing righteousness. And how many of you know, if you practice, you get better. You get better. It breaks my heart when somebody thinks being saved is just saying you are and then doing whatever you want. See, listen, I'll never do enough works to be saved. I'll never do enough works of righteousness looking like Christ to be saved. But it's because I'm saved that I'm doing the works to look like Christ. You understand? It's a sign that I really am. I really have a relationship with the Son. It's because I'm pushing to the very thing that I am. If it's not of me, I'll quit because I don't want it. If eternity bugs me, I'll quit and be opposed to it. There are plenty of people that start. Remember the, the parable of the ten virgins? How, how many of the ten had oil? No, they all did. All ten had oil. The Bible says for five of them it ran out. All ten started, but they didn't finish, did they? Five of them ran out, and they did not think the wedding of this person in the parable was important enough. They did not think it was important enough to maintain oil in their vessel. Remember I said we leak? It didn't say that the other five didn't leak or that it went out. It said they maintained it. The others did not, and they ran out. And then when the call came out at midnight, because you don't know when the call is going to happen, but when the midnight cry came, and they all got, the, they got, they got their lamps, and they're going to go to the wedding because they thought it was important to maintain the oil. And then those that didn't said, give me some of yours. And they said, we can't do that. We might not have enough to get to the party ourselves. Let me just say it this way. You will never get heaven on somebody else's coattails. You will never get it because of somebody else. You will get it because of your relationship with Jesus Christ, period. You won't do it off your mamas, your papas, your preachers, your church, your friends. You're going to get there because you personally have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. And when they get to the door, and what happens? Those that have the lamp and they came because of the call, they all got in. And those who tried to get it later, when it was too late, they get to the door. The door's closed and they say, come on, you know us, let us in. And the voice says, I don't know you. Now look, in the parable of the neighborhood, yes, that person behind that door knew them. But they also knew that these people had no respect for the marriage of their son. And because they had no respect, let me just say it in a nice way, you're dead to me. <laughs> because they had no respect, they say, I don't know you. Listen, this is a picture of the end. When we come to the end, what does the Bible say? You can't come in because you sin too much. Is that what, is, is that what we hear? Why don't we hear that? Because Jesus died for sin. Nobody's going to miss it because of sin. His love is complete. The Bible says God desires that all would be saved. If he hadn't paid for it, I can't offer it to you today. Why is it the, the person that had the feast, the king that had the feast, what does he do? It's a picture of God. And he tells, invites everybody and, you know, of his friends and neighbors and all that. And some didn't come. And he said, well, then go and invite the rest of the town. And some of them didn't come. And they said, we still, we're loaded. We, got, we had food for enough. For... He said, just invite everybody. Everybody. It's a picture that God invited the whole world. But let me tell you, he'll never invite you if he doesn't have provision. Therefore, there's provision for the whole world. Remember, there's inheritance for everybody. But if you don't want your inheritance, don't worry. We'll get it. It'll be passed out. There won't be any inheritance left. It's going to be passed out to whoever comes. It was for everybody. It was for everybody. God's there for everybody to change our hearts, to move us toward Him, to get us on the practice field of righteousness. 
And, and what happens when I hear the call of the Lord? What happens when the Spirit is drawing me? And what happens when I say yes? The Spirit comes into here. For what purpose? What, what does He do when He comes into your heart? Look what it says. He who sins is, is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose... For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Remember the Bible says we used to be like them. We used to be riotous. We used to be sinful. We used to do all those same things. Imagine any kind of sin you can think of. We were, we probably all done it in here. We got enough people that every sin, about almost every sin you can think of, we probably pulled off right here. But when Jesus came in, you know what he starts to do? He starts to destroy the works of the devil in our lives. He pulls me off the practice field of darkness and puts me on the practice field of righteousness. He says, because you're in relationship with me now, and how many, how many of you know he's different? And he shows me who he is. And these works diminish, and his works increase. And I can know I'm his because my whole life is being changed. And what is it? I have been touched by eternity. I have been touched by my future. And I'm now living in a way that people can see it. You know, he says, those who will not confess me before men, I will deny before my father. We start living a life that now shows that something has happened to us. It is our future being lived out. Look at this last one. 1 John chapter 5, verse 11. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. How many of you are glad you got eternal life today? Are you glad you got eternal life today? Listen, that's our future and we got it. But how did it get to us? How did we get eternal life? Look what it says. And this life is in the Son. If you don't have the Son, you don't have it. Look what it says. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. Keep going. That you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. See, those of us that have it today are those of us that should be believing it tomorrow and living it tomorrow because those truly that are His do not stop. We continue on. We persevere. We bear up. We can be persecuted. We can have, all kind, we can have hard situations. We can have whatever, and we will still believe and live for our Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> Woo. This is eternal life, that you have the Son. You see, when I go before Him, he'll, He's either going to know me or He's not going to know me. That's it. You, you don't pray to God and God gives you a ticket. See, a lot of us think it that way. Some of us, we call grace the ticket. Well, I'm saved by the ticket of God, the grace of God. No, no. It's not a ticket. It's a person. I'm saved by the person. When I come before the person, the person will know me because I did not reject him. The person will know me and say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Enter in. Enter into the joy of the Lord. That's what he's going to say. Another place, he says this, I don't know you. I don't know you. Depart from me. Here, and he'll say the problem. The problem is not that you just, you just did too many sins. Because how many of you know Moses was a murderer, but he turned to a relationship with God, and he's in heaven today. Come on. He will say, depart from me, you who loved darkness more than light. You see, when it comes to that person that you get, that person of Jesus, all that will matter is do you love him 
or do you really love somebody else? Because if you, this, you may say it and people may see it, but if in the end your heart really loves to do the darkness, you know, hey, I'm glad I said a prayer, I did this, but you know, but it's okay for me to be doing all the darkness because it's okay. No, the Bible says people will think they're going in and then find out they're not because their love was in the wrong place. They love darkness rather than having to live in the light. Remember what it says, that if we live in the light, then we don't mind that our deeds are exposed. Because they're, they're, we're changing. You know, if I do wrong, I confess it. I don't mind putting myself before the light. But those who don't want God will run from the light. They'll live in darkness and be okay with that. So, this is Mark's message. As we go through this gospel, you will find that he's telling us about the Son of God, and he will tell you the Son of God is worthy to be listened to. And if he truly is the Son of God, and I'm telling you, he is, I'm way past guessing. I'm way past wondering. Right now, if I don't live for God, I'm a fool. God's done way too much for me, has shown me way too much for me not to live for God. Come on, do you understand? Because that's what it is to have a living relationship with God. We move and we grow and we get to him to where it doesn't matter what a scientist tells you. It doesn't matter what a politician tells you. It doesn't matter what somebody who's following their feelings tells you. You know who your God is by the faith that is now turned into reality. Amen. He draws you by his Holy Spirit into something you haven't yet known and you can't even experience. But once you begin to experience it, he will turn that into to something that I, I love it when he says, even your flesh can begin to know the difference between good and evil. What does that mean? The flesh I put in so much darkness has now been put in so much light that even the flesh begins to tell me, uh-uh, that's not God. How many of you like it when your flesh says it? No, no, that's not God. Your flesh will tell you right away, don't go in there. I know what's in there. Don't go in there. That's when you've been around God enough that even your flesh will start helping you go the right way. See, it's a sad thing when you have burned all your bridges and you have no more conscience and your flesh doesn't help you. It, it holds you in darkness and it's like a, like a drug addicted. But when you take it out of that, even the flesh can begin to warn you of things that are ungodly. Let's make sure we're being conformed. Let's make sure we're being changed. Let's make sure we're hearing the Son of God, which is meaning we are obeying the Son of God. He is our Lord. He is our Savior. He is our future. He is our eternity. Let's start living today like all that is true because it is. Why don't you stand? Whew. Yeah, amen. <clears throat> now listen, some of you uh, may be here and God's opened your heart. God's drawn you to himself. And we can't do that. God does that. It's, it's amazing to me how he puts something together that we could not. He'll open up a heart ready to change their lives. All you have to do is respond to it. He said, if you draw near to me, I will draw near to you. You're not sure there's a God, but yet he's opened up your heart here today, then move on in. He will reveal himself to you. Those who seek are going to find. Those who knock, the door will be opened. So if God's done that to you, you know you need him as your Lord and Savior, then my brother, my sister, be bold and, and raise a hand and confess that you, you need that. You may be here and you may say, I felt like I've been far from God, but yet he's drawn me today. Well, then come on. And, and, and let this moment be your moment too. If you took him off the throne and you were, you've been Lord for a while, well, get yourself back off of there. Put him back where he belongs. He is Lord and Savior of your life. Not just Savior. He's Lord and Savior of your life. So if that's you today, brother, sister, be bold and, and raise that hand so we can say a prayer with you. I'll, I'll lead you in that prayer and all your brothers and sisters will say it. But you've got to be bold to identify and say, that's me, Pastor Rick. I need this prayer. Anybody in the room that needs this prayer, giving your heart, your life to the Lord, raise your hand up high and we'll say this prayer with you. We'll say this prayer with you. Right here's a hand, little girl. Amen. Oh, yeah, I see that hand. Maybe a child will lead them. 
Maybe a child will lead them. Anybody else need this prayer? Anybody else need this prayer? Raise your hand up high if you need it. All right, praise God. You know, and we talked about the Holy Spirit. We talked about uh, Jesus needed to be filled. And you may say, uh, how does that happen? Well, listen, the Bible says, how much more will the Father give his children who ask the Holy Spirit? You have to ask with your heart wide open. You have to get rid of your resistance and, and believe that he will give you beyond where you are at. He will fill you with his presence. So as we do this prayer and as we say this prayer with uh, our sister here who raised her hand, for you who know, uh, li listen, it's a, it's, a, it's a thing of faith. Uh, when I asked for the Holy Spirit, I did it by faith. I didn't do it by like, you got to do something to me. I believe that when I asked, I had it. So when I asked for the Holy Spirit, when that prayer was over, when I asked for the Holy Spirit, I began to thank God for it. Amen. I said, thank you for the Holy Spirit, Lord. I've asked and you've given. And you know what? He started showing me proofs that I had the Holy Spirit and, and things in the Bible because I'd asked in faith and believed and trust. So if you need that, you make sure you do the same. You ask the Lord for all that he has for you to do ministry in your life to be able to touch this world. Amen. All right, with our sister, we're going to pray this. And listen, she was brave, but if you weren't, but you mean it, say this prayer. God knows. If you mean it, say this prayer. And we're going to have everybody who really meant that prayer to be able to go and be over here and get prayer with whether it's Pastor Ken or somebody. Pastor Ken, there he is. All right, let's say this prayer together with our sister. Dear Lord, I thank you today for the words I've heard. You have used them to draw me to yourself. So right now, in front of all these witnesses, I receive you, Jesus, as my Lord and my Savior. Come live in me. Thank you for dying for my sin and removing them out of the way. I turn from those sins and choose to live for you. And now, Holy Spirit, come and fill me and teach me the ways of Jesus that I might follow after him all the days of my life. And it's according to your word that I can declare by faith that I am saved in Jesus' name. Amen and amen and amen and amen and amen. And listen, when this service is over, Pastor Ken and, and Leonard are going to make their way over here. And as soon as everybody sits down, they start dismissing. You can come on over there. They'll pray with you. And anybody else who meant that prayer, but you didn't raise your hand, then be willing to go over and acknowledge it with Pastor Ken and Lynn. Amen? All right, church, you know what we got? Seven days. Seven days. Let's not waste them. Man, let God get into your neighborhood. When you walk into a place that ought to make a difference, just like demons screamed out with Jesus, the, the, the darkness ought to know you came into a room too. Let's start believing the Lord, following after him, paying attention to his leading, pray as he would have us pray, and watch what can happen in your seven days before you get back here. Amen? Amen. This is where we hear the word, we get charged up, but now we go out and live the life. Amen? Amen. Well, Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for this opportunity with our brothers and sisters. Thank you for everything that you, you have given to us in your love, in this relationship. Lord, may we continue to yield to you and the Holy Spirit. May you fill us with your presence, your boldness, your power. May your word become clear to us, Lord. And as we live this life, may people see the very salvation we claim in our very lives, giving you all the honor and glory for it. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. Amen.